All I can say today is, wow, did you read those lessons? Where am I supposed to go with this? How am I supposed to give you a nice, warm, fuzzy sermon that's going to be kind of slightly milk toastish and but give you that nice, warm feeling inside. So as you drive away from church today, you abruptly forgive it because it was so milk toasty and sweet. It's not where our lessons go today. And my sermons have to be captive to the lessons that we see today. Otherwise, I'm probably not really preaching the Word of God. So I looked through these and I thought, man, where is this all going? It's all doom and gloom and the end of the world and things burning up and, and getting lost. And oh my gosh, it's these, these verses are all terrible. And when I say terrible, remember I don't mean terrible as in yucky pooey. I mean terrible as in the real word root of terrible. To inspire terror. Right? Terrible. Terror. Terrible. Things can be terrible and good, you know, at the same time. We can see things that are terrible in life, but they can ultimately take us to a good place. Terrible doesn't mean terrible, I think, all the time in the way we think about it. But looking at our lessons today, we're, we're getting quite a healthy dose of reality today. And I think that's where our lessons are taking us, or at least that's what I'm seeing today. This concept of reality. It is this undeniable way that the world works regardless of what we think, regardless of what we want to be true, regardless of where we want to go, the world has rules of its own. Now, we can get away with stuff for a long time, right? We're, we're pretty good at that. We, we've developed that into a fine art. Reality, that which exists beyond what we want necessarily to believe. One of the great keys of life is to try to make sure that your thinking is in line with reality. If you can kind of skirt the edge of reality, kind of like a surfer on the edge of a wave, you might have a better time of it. But we have become today a professional chattering class. We are a chattering class. You can go anywhere you want and someone will tell you anything you want to hear. You can find it. And these, these can be accredited people. Dr. So-and-so tells you what. And you, you, can, you, you can very easily today gather a whole world around you that tells you what you want to hear. And so far, we've been able to get away with it. So far, things haven't come crashing down as we read in our gospel today as we read in our other, other places to do, that you see, we have this wish list, don't we? We all do it. I'm not talking politics here. I'm not talking ageism here. I'm not talking race or religion. We all do it. We all have that world view that we want. Oh, we so desperately hope it's real. And then every once in a while, the world comes along and smack. And so it's really, what do we do? What do we do? We thrash around, we try different things, right? We, we try to, to regard our lives and people and our society and our environment in so many ways. We, throw, we think maybe if we throw enough out there, some of it will stick. Well, I got some of it, right? But I think you probably know as well as I do, there's, there's kind of an increasing you know, tendency today in our world, which have you ever just seen people just bold face lie to I mean just lie to you. And you stand there and you go, you just lie to me. And they don't care. They don't care. Notice I'm not going one way or another of this, you know, in the ways that you may think I'm going, what? what's going on in here? What's going on here? And I think it's just a disregard for reality. We, we don't know what reality is anymore. We don't care about reality anymore. And I think it may be because we've gotten away with not being real for so long that we've kind of taken that and we've made that our new reality. Is the punch in the face coming? I don't know. When is it going to come? I don't know. Will it ever come? Oh, I can, I can espouse a worldview that tells me everything's just hunky-dory. And it's just going to keep going on and on and on and on. Everything's just going to be fine. Just fine. But is that reality? 
Let's go to our lessons for today. And today I'm, I'm going to go right into the middle, right into the heart of it, right into the heart of the maelstrom. Why right not? Let's go to our second reading for today. And I'll tell you what, this, this, this whole thing here from 2 Second Thessalonians 3, most pastors don't know what to do with this. I, I don't know what to do with this. Or, or what do you want me to do with this? Because I think it tells us something that's uncomfortable. And it tells us something that we don't want to believe. And it tells us something, well, that may be counter to our reality. Because we've, we've bucked this for so long. We've, we've created our own reality around this. Well, I'm going to try to cut to some of the quick here today. What's it about? Idleness. Idleness. Are you idle? Are people that you know idle? Idle meaning you just don't get anything done. At least not anything of value. And that's what's interesting, of value. You ever gone on YouTube? Everybody today wants to be a YouTube star. Oh my, our young people, that's all they want to do. Do they want to go to college and become, learn how to become a doctor or a lawyer or a, an astronaut? Or, oh no, they want to be the next YouTube star. They want to get a million hits. And you go out there and what a morass of just insane stuff sometimes. Try it sometimes. I don't get that on your smart TV or not. Just flip through it. You can find anything out there. And it's not just young people. It's people out there and they really think they're just going to say whatever. And you're going to suck it up and believe it. Idleness. Why do I say that's being idle? Not in all instances. I saw, for example, yesterday a video on how to winterize your RV. That was a great video. I learned a whole lot of stuff. I would say that's not idleness. But some of the things out there. Well, let's, uh, let's kind of pick this apart a little bit. Second, Second Thessalonians chapter 3. What is it that Paul's not talking about? He's not talking about the infirm. He's not talking about the elderly. He's not talking about those who can't work. We are called to have compassion and we are called to love one another and care for one another. But what about those who can? But they bow out. No, I'm not, I'm not doing any work. I'm not doing any work because I don't have to. I don't have to. I, went, I flipped to the internet and it was, it was interesting. This may be a little bit of ageism, but it just, I, I didn't want to like dwell on it for too terribly long. Gen Zers, you know, the Gen Zers, that's kind of our youngest category of, of working youth today. And I'm not picking on Gen Zers, I'm really not. And I'm not saying this is all of them, but the quote stood out to me. They are the cohort most likely to quit if they're unsatisfied with work. Well, who at some point isn't unsatisfied with work? What is work? Work, by definition, is you buckle down and you do something that other people don't want to do. That's why they pay you. Because what you're doing probably really stinks. At least somewhere along the way. It's either something that nobody wants to do or something that people don't know how to do. Which means it's probably hard. Which means it's probably difficult. Which means you probably go home at the end of the day with a headache, at least a little one, until you have dinner and you kind of spark up a little bit. Work, by definition, is things that other people don't want to do. So when we say, well, you know what, if I just don't like this, I'm going to quit. Hmm. It's starting to sound a little bit like our second reading for today, 2 Thessalonians 3. And once again, I don't mean to pick on the Gen Zers, I really don't. I think we all have a little bit of this, and we're all kind of taking on this attitude today. If I don't like it, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, tell that to your great-grandparents who are in the ground out there. They would laugh at you. Kiddo, my whole life was stuff that I didn't want to do. But we had to buck up and we had to make do with what we had. What's Paul talking about here? Those who are living in idleness. Verse 10, for even when we were with you, we gave you this command, anyone unwilling to work should not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. Have you ever fooled yourself into thinking you're doing work? Have you ever had that day where, oh boy, you're just, boy, you're just a bustling around the house. And you're lifting that, and you're moving that, and you're nailing that, and you're, oh my, oh my gosh, well, well, I worked hard today. And at the end of the day, you got nothing done. Why is that? 
Well, because you probably really got nothing or very little done. Busy work, idleness, and being a busy body kind of all tie together. Do you accomplish goals? Are you happy at the end of the day with what you've done? Are you content? Not happy in the sense that, boy, I sure really love mopping out that basement. But, boy, I sure am glad that's done. That really needed to be done. And so we're talking about busy bodies. Let's, let's, what's, what's Jesus talking about here? Excuse me, Paul talking about reality. The world is the way the world is. And here's a quick test. Here's something you can do. So we're talking about people not being willing to work. And if they shouldn't work, they shouldn't eat. Wow, that's pretty severe. But, you know, let's, let's boil it down to this. Let's say that we've got folks in our community that don't want to work. They can, but they don't want to. So let's just all do what they're doing. Tomorrow, we just all do what they're doing. Just give up. All right, Hey, you ain't working, I'm. You're not working, I'm not going to. Where would we be? Where would we be? And that's kind of a test. What is Jesus talking, or excuse me, I keep saying Jesus, Paul. What is Paul talking about here? There's just realities in the world, and the reality of the world is, is if you sit down long enough and you don't move, you're going to get hungry and you're going to get thirsty. For some reason, God has created this world in such a way that we have to keep moving, we have to keep doing, or we have to rely on somebody who moves and does in a way that we can or won't. I, I know this sermon is kind of stinks. I don't really like preaching all this to you. But once again, look at what do we have to work with today? I think harsh truths. Harsh truths. The gospel. The world works in a certain way. We go to our gospel, and this is what we're looking at again. God is saying, no, this is going to go a certain way, folks. You can go ahead and wish all you want. You can go ahead and, and plan all you want. But like that temple, it's going to come crashing down eventually. So if you work with that reality, what can you do about it? So the, Jesus is talking end time stuff here. And it's fascinating how Jesus' second largest discussion with his disciples that's recorded, that's what this is today. It's all about the end times. It's all about where we're going. It's all about what's going to happen. And look at, look at what Jesus says. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first. But the end will not follow. They must. Why, Jesus? Why must they? Isn't there something I can do about it? Can I change the world? Jesus says, no, these things must take place. Go to verse 13. This will give you an opportunity to testify. All of what? All of this horror and terror and all earthquakes and famines and plagues and portents and great signs in heaven. Hmm, does that kind of sound a little bit like today? Maybe just a little bit. And then we find out that having faith in Christ and having faith in Jesus, we can't even go there if what we're trying to do is gather to ourselves a comfy, simple life. Look, all I want to do is be comfy and be left alone. Nope, sorry. Not if you're a follower of Christ. Maybe if you're a follower of the world, you might be able to get away with it for a while. What does Jesus say, though? He says, this will give you an opportunity to testify. All the struggle will give you an opportunity to testify, which is what's really important. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you the words and the wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. They will not be able to withstand it or contradict it. The word of God through Jesus Christ. Now here's what your opponents probably are going to do. You're wrong. But wait a minute, isn't that a contradiction? You're wrong. Well, let me tell you why you're wrong. Blah, 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 blah. But is what they said real? And see, that's another trap we fall into. We listen to folks and we listen to things that may go counter to the word of God and they may flat out tell us we're insane and we're wrong and we're crazy and all that exists is what you can see today and all you can take part in today. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you die. That's been around forever. Just their contradiction, though, 
doesn't mean the word of God is false. That's what G Jesus is talking about. I'll give you the words. They will not be able to withstand or can contradict what I tell you. You will be hated all because of my name, but not a hair on your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. Might you be killed? He already said that. Might you be burned? He already said that. Might you be imprisoned? He already said that. He already said these things might happen to you, but not a hair on your head will perish. Perish. And that's the truth. That's the reality. That's the good news. You see, we can talk about what's going on at the worldly level. Boy, I'm really struggling right now. And then there's what goes on at the spiritual level and the eternal level. And that's what God cares about. And that's what God sees. And that's what God says is true. Don't let the world defeat you. Don't let the world steal from you that which is real and true, which is the gospel, the good news, eternal life. That's ultimately what counts. That's why not a hair on your head will perish. Perish, meaning be destroyed for eternity. It cannot and will not happen. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. Endurance. My friends, stand the test. Be real as much as you can possibly be real. Remember the old saying, if you're like the mighty oak and the wind comes and you can be cracked and broken and fall over. That's where our world views lock us in, in rigidity. Instead, be like that palm tree, right? The one that says, oh, okay, I see what's really going on here. And then what do we do? We put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ and he sees us through with the endurance that we gain in our souls. So let's go forth strengthened in this good news that ultimately God's message is eternal. And that is the great truth and the great reality. Amen. Amen.